Well, brethren, I hope you're all having a wonderful day. I do have a story to tell today. And uh, if you know me, it's a story about hunting. And a disclaimer, it's totally rated G, so you don't have to have your children leave the room or anything. It's milder than Bambi. Uh, and it started around the turn of the century. And I'm talking about the 21st century, uh, about 23 years ago. This is story happened then. Um, I, we'd, we'd, my family had gone to the Feast of Tabernacles, and we had arrived home. And uh, almost a day later, I got on a plane. And what we did was, or what I did was, I flew to Colorado um, to hunt up in Colorado with my brothers and my father and my uncles and one of my nephews. And we went from about 400 feet here in Dallas to about to 5,280 in Denver International. And then my brother and my nephew picked me up at the airport, and we drove two hours up to about 6,500 feet. And so I was starting to feel a little bit of altitude sickness when I got up there. I had to help with uh, setting the camp up, and um, I was drinking a lot of water, and that's why I brought up some water up here today, because I'm going to be talking about drinking some water, I think. And, um, and then we, we got camp set up. That night was fine. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up, and I had a little bit of a headache. Um, it was altitude sickness. I was dealing with that. And I was drinking a lot of water. I was um, feeling that effects of the altitude. And then about four o'clock rolls around and it's time to get up, get ready for hunting. So what we did was we, I got all my stuff ready. Uh, I got with my brother, my younger brother and his son, and we started up the mountain. So we are, we're traveling up the mountain and I get about a quarter of the way up and I am starting to really puff hard. I can't breathe. I, I'm drinking all of my water. And at this time in my life, I was running about two miles a day. I thought I was in really good shape, and I thought I was going to die. I thought it was just too much for me. And so on and on, about every 100 yards, I'd have to stop, get my breath, take a drink of water. And then we'd do some more. We, we finally got up to the top of the mountain, and this is all before the sun came up. We found a nice spot to sit down to kind of watch over this big old hay field that was sitting up there. And uh, I think I might have dozed off, you know, a little bit just before the sun came up because you can't do anything anyways. And so we, we sat there until about 9.30 in the morning. Nothing. It was just a nice, peaceful day up in, in a hay field up in the mountains. And um, I told my brother, you know, the best way, I think, to get over this altitude sickness is to uh, do some more exercise. And, you know, kind of work it out. And I said, I'm going to walk across the hayfield, and we're going to walk down the other side, or I'm going to do that. And he said, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'll just stay here. But my nephew said, I'll go with you. And I said, all right, let's go. So we walked across that hayfield, down the other side of the mountain, which was about another three-quarters of a mile down to the other side of the mountain. So we get down there, and we're looking over a nice field with some trees and we're sitting down there and um, time passes by and nothing happens. We see nothing but birds and squirrels and chipmunks. And then it was about 11.30, I heard something coming down the mountain. And um, it was a little, a little engine and, and I knew who it was. My father was coming down the side of the mountain and he was riding a Honda ATV or ATC. And if you know what that is, it's a three-wheeled you know, hazardous material, you know, vehicle. Uh, one of the most unstable vehicles the Honda ever made. But he's still riding it. He's coming down that hill. He's putting. He's going, ch -ch 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 -ch, and he comes right up, and he stops right in front of us. Asks us what we're doing and how we're doing, and did you see anything? And we said no. And, and he said, well, that's too bad. And uh, then he starts to chide us about how smart he was that he was riding that three-wheeled vehicle. That, you know, if I... You guys are, you know, you had to walk all the way down here. Why didn't you think about getting this thing? And he just kept on and on about, you know, really how, you know, it would have really been a smart thing if you had thought about this earlier. And, and then when he was fun, t tired of doing that, he got back on the vehicle and he headed back up the mountain and he left us there. So, so we waited about another 30 minutes and I, I told my nephew, all right, let's go back. We got a long walk ahead of us and... Uh, I got my canteen and I got a drink out of my canteen and there was probably about 
I'd say about a cup left in my canteen. It was a quart canteen. And just as I'm putting this thing up to my mouth, my nephew said, hey, can I have a drink? And I go, uh, well, where's your water? And he said, well, I drank it all on the top of the mountain. So I gave him a drink, and he took a really big, you know, drink. It's kind of like my wife says, a daddy drink. You know, a little water splashing off his face. And he gave it back to me, and I, had the, I basically emptied the rest of it out. So we, I slung my rifle, and we started walking back up the hill. And again, about every 100 yards, I'm having to stop and breathe. But now I had no water. And so we were walking, doing the same thing. My nephew kept talking to me. He kept asking me questions about hunting and different things. And I, I would stop, and I would tell him what the answer was. And then we'd start to walk again. We got about halfway up the mountain, and uh, I just stopped after a question he asked, and I said, we can either walk or we can talk, but I can't do both. <laughs> and I turned, and you know, we're sitting there resting now, and I looked up the trail, this Jeep trail, and I saw something. I saw something sitting in the center of the road. I'm already thirsty now. <laughs> so I unslung my rifle, and I looked through my rifle scope, and I'm looking at this thing, and I, I looked again, I looked at what it was, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like a mirage. And so I slung the rifle over my shoulder, and I said, let's go. And we started kind of double-timing it up the mountain. We got up to it, and there sitting in the middle of the road was two cans of Pepsi, <laughs> ice-cold Pepsi, sitting on a paper plate. Now, I, I, I remember this like it was yesterday. I looked over at my nephew, and his mouth was completely open. His eyes were real big. He's like, what is this? Oh, what, oh, who did this? And um, so I'm, I'm like, oh, okay. And so I reached down, and I grabbed a can, and he grabbed another can, and we popped them open, and we took a couple of really big drinks out of those soda pops. Now, I told this story up in, in Sherman. Um, what happens when you do that, when you take a couple of really big drinks of a carbonated soda? Well, you could kind of hear it all the way down through the valley. <laughs> a little bell, of, you know, staccato going down the valley. But then I went down and I, I looked at the paper plate. There was something written on it. And so I picked up the paper plate. And on that plate, it said, I thought you could use some refreshment. Signed, Dad. Now, brethren, I don't know, but I, I can guess that probably most people in the congregation right here today have had a moment like that in their life, a moment in time where you started out strong. I thought, you know, I was ready for this trip. I was ready to tackle the mountain, and then things that I had not thought about came up. I used up all of my energy. I ended up using all my water, too. Or, you know, uh, you may have had a situation where you were beaten down by situations in life, just trying to get through whatever it was, and then you were delightfully restored or refreshed back so you felt so good and restored back to like when you were at the beginning. What picture comes to your mind when you think of being refreshed, restored? Is it something that's only temporary? or something that's lasting, something that takes a long time. Well, that Pepsi that my father left me was, quite frankly, an amazing moment of refreshment for me and my nephew. It, it gave me the lift that I needed, and it changed my attitude right there on that road. I wasn't, you know, irritated anymore at my nephew for asking all these questions, because he was just like a little chatterbox. And in hunting, you're not supposed to be talking. You're supposed to be quiet. It restored my whole attitude, my energy level. But brethren, it only lasted for about an hour. Now, I told him, don't drink at all, because that's all you have. Because I wasn't going to give him any more of mine at that time. I'm bigger than you. You're not getting no more. What about our Father in heaven? What about our Father in heaven? What amazing, refreshing, and restorative things does he give the children?
that he loves. Let's think about that for a minute. There's a scripture that talks about both refreshment and restoration, and that is a need that all of us have. That is a need that all of us have, and it's found in Acts chapter 3. So if you would, let's turn over together to the book of Acts chapter 3. It's a need that every single one of us have. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And I want you to put your marker here because we're going to come back in a little while to this scripture. Acts 3, verse 19. We read, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And then verse 20, And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Brethren, when we read this scripture, it just jumps out at you right away. What are these times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord? And then what is this restoration of all things that he's also talking about here? Well, brethren, these times of restoration, these moments or these times of refreshment, they're opportunities for us that God wants us to experience in our lives and also to be a part of. Brethren, and what this does is it truly feel, fills a deep need that each and every one of us have. So today what we're going to do is we're going to magnify these two verses, verses 19 and 21. In verse 19, what are these times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord? And then in verse 21, what is this time of restoration of all things? What is God trying to restore? Let's look at that one first. Keep your marker here in Acts and turn with me back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. What was it like at the end of the creation week? What was it like at the end of the creation week? Remember what God said after he had created everything? He said it was very good. It was very good. And at that time, it was characterized by love, uh, by peace, by obedience. He created man and woman to be his family. God created mankind to have a relationship with him. Now, we know what happened. We know the story well. It didn't take too long before Satan's deception, and Mr. Cobernot talked a little bit about that. It didn't take too long before man was disobedient, and as a result, disobedience led to mankind being cut off from the tree of life, from God. You know, in fact, it degenerated so far that by the time you get to Genesis 6, we see the tragic results in verse 5, and so let's go there. Genesis 6 and verse 5. And we read, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What we have here is a broken relationship. There was a time when the relationship between God and man was good, it was very good, but now it's broken. You see, that's describing a, a very broken or dysfunctional relationship between God and mankind. The children that he created to have a loving relationship with him is now broken. You know, that is the world around us now. It's not too hard to see. It's everywhere we go. And that this has continued all the way down to today, this very day. Death, sin, and wickedness have spread to all mankind. But we also know, brethren, that God has a solution. He has a solution to this. God's plan is a plan of restoration. It's a plan to repair things. It's a plan to restore the broken relationship that he had, he has with his children. In fact, there are many events throughout the Bible that point to the, the it's evidence that God is, has been and is now actively in the process of restoration. So what we're going to do is today, to start off, we are going to, I'm going to give you three events 
of God reaching out to his children to restore his children back to him. So if you would, turn with, you, with me to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 11. Let's, let's go back to the time of the children of Israel, when Israel itself was restored. Now, so here, the children of Israel, we know the story again. Joseph um, was sold into slavery. He uh, rises to the most important office in the land. And at that time, there was famine in the land, and he invites his father Jacob, uh, his family, his brothers, all the hosts of all the Israelites to live in Egypt and they lived in peace, they, and they did that for years. They lived in peace and harmony in Egypt for a long time until Pharaoh saw them as a threat and enslaved them. And what happened was that they forgot who God was. All of the, th all of the points that Mr. Coponaut gave was probably involved in them forgetting who God was. They were probably prohibited from keeping God's law. They forgot because of lack of use and the other two. Their relationship again was broken with God. So let's read Exodus 15, verse 11 through 13. And this is the song of Moses. Um, just previously uh, to this song written, uh, the, uh, the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea. So let's go ahead and read Exodus 15, verse 11 through down through verse 13. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness? fearful in praises, doing wonders. Verse 12, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. And that's what I'd like to focus on there. And you and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The children of Israel were freed from slavery they came out of Egypt with a high hand. They crossed the Red Sea. That was God redeeming his children back to him. He restored them back to himself. He gave them his law, made a covenant with them, and desiring a true relationship with them. But because of their unbelief, they wandered through the desert. But God kept his promise to those who are, were under 20 years old, and after 40 years, they were brought to the promised land. God restored Israel back to him. So let's turn over to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. Let's look at another event where God restored his children. So let's go ahead and fast forward through history uh, to, the, to the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Now, because of their disobedience and their unfaithfulness, both Israel in the north at about 722 B.C. and then Judah in the south in 586 B.C., they both went into captivity. But God made a promise to the kingdom of Judah to punish the Babylonians, and after 70 years, he would restore Judah back to himself. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. And God restored them back to himself to restore their relationship together based on God's principles. It's an amazing example of how God keeps his promises in very specific detail. Now, more importantly, we look ahead. Those are the examples in the past, but more importantly now, we look ahead to the day of the future restoration of Israel and of all things. We know that the restoration is going to be in the kingdom of God. And that's what Luke was inspired to write in, in Acts chapter 3. That's what he was talking about, the restoration of all things. Jesus Christ is going to return. And as king of kings, he's going to establish his government. He will restore that government on the earth. There will be order, there will be peace, there will be happiness, and there will be every opportunity at that time 
to live in harmony with, with the others on this earth and also with God himself. Have a relationship, a true relationship at that time. Turn with me over now to Micah chapter 4, verse 1. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. Now let's look at another event where God restored his children. Well, brethren, I'm sorry, this, this is the, in the book of Micah here, this is what we read every year at the Feast of Tabernacles, and we may even read this on the Feast of Trumpets this year. The book of Micah describes the very time, and let's notice, notice what it says about this amazing time when all things will be restored. Micah 4, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. And those, and those mountains are representative of, of government. God's government will be over all. Let's continue. And many, and many and shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. And then in verse 2, many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Brethren, a true relationship with God and his children will be restored. That opportunity at that time will be for everyone. And then it says, he will judge between many peoples, and he will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They will not learn war anymore. Brethren, imagine restoring right government, a restoring a right relationship with the people of this earth, between nations, a right relationship between the land so that it will, re, it will produce abundantly everywhere. That's part of the restoration of all things. Getting back to a time when the conditions existed when God said that all he, that he had made was good before the time that man was separated from God because of sin. And the great thing is, brethren, that we understand that truth right now. We have the opportunity to be a part of this restoration process, to be a part of the very thing that God's plan for restoration, developing the character that he can use in the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's turn back to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And verse 19. Hope you kept your marker there. So in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, we also read about the times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Let's read that again. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, it's interesting here in Acts chapter 3 that the word that is used for refreshing is only used once. It's a, uh, it means to be revived, like catching your breath. Uh, it can mean cooling, like a cooling off, like that Pepsi that I drank that day. Uh, it could mean like a cool glass of water or a lemonade, something that refreshes you and, and revives your ability to do things. Barnes' note says it denotes any kind of refreshment, as rest or deliverance from evils of any kind, a calming of aggression or of desperation. Brethren, and these times of refreshment are conditional. They're conditional to the process of repentance and conversion that we're all going through at this time. And because we are close to God, in the presence of God, these times of refreshment will come to us. Well, like I talked about three events of restoration, I'd like to talk about three occasions of refreshment, three occasions of refreshing or revitalization that we experience now and that come from God. So if you would turn with me over to Titus, the book of Titus chapter 3, verse 4. Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. Three occasions. This is the first event or occasion of refreshment. 
Titus chapter 3, verse 4. One of the occasions, brethren, of refreshing is at baptism. Repentance and baptism and receiving of the Holy Spirit. And that's almost exactly what it says in, in, in uh, Acts 3, verse 19. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Well, over in Titus chapter 3, it expands on that thought. Titus 3, verse 4. But when the kindness of the Lord, love of our love our God, I'm sorry, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then in verse 7, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Well, brethren, what is this time of washing and regeneration and renewing? It's at baptism, when we're baptized, when we're washed completely, when we are immersed in that watery grave, when we put, off, when we put that old person to death, and we come out of those waters a new creation in Christ. It points to the, that very time of repentance and baptism as a time of refreshing. A refreshment that comes from God. Where we get rid of that old sinful self and we put on Christ. And what a challenge that is for each and every one of us when that happens. Not just to put on a little bit of Jesus Christ, but to be totally and completely refreshed. You know, as we think about our lives as Christians, what we do on a daily basis, every day of our life. How much are we refreshed in our approach to living like Christ? I mean, when we think about all the responsibilities that we have in this life, being a husband or a wife, um, our work life, our jobs, um, students in school, you know, and on and on, all of the things, that, all of the hats that we put on. Now, with all of those responsibilities, do we have a tendency to imagine any one of those that God is not a part of? If we fall into that way of looking at our relationship with God, that's a problem. That's a big problem. It's not acceptable to God. God doesn't want to be just another relationship in our life. He wants to be at the center and the foundation of every relationship that we have. At baptism, we, made, we dedicate our life to God. And so where is God in our life? Have we taken the refreshment of repentance and, you know, and baptism, not just delegate a part of our life that way, but really take to heart Acts chapter 3, verse 19, and make him our life. God is our life. Christianity isn't something that just costs a little bit. It costs our entire life. And so we can have a new life. Um, we can have that refreshment. We can have renewal as we, we repent and are baptized and receive God's Holy Spirit. That certainly is a time of refreshment. Let's turn back now to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31, verse 16. A second occasion of refreshment. And that is honoring God on his Sabbath day. Exodus 31, verse 16. Exodus 31, verse 16. Therefore, and this is a reiteration of the second or the fourth commandment here by Moses. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. We've heard that before. Verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. God was refreshed. It's very clear here. He made the heavens, the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. And it's so interesting that the passage says here that he was refreshed. God never gets tired. What was he refreshed by? You know, it, it, he said it was very good. Well, brethren, God made the Sabbath for you and for me. In Genesis 2, verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. He sanctified it and he set it apart for a holy purpose. 
So as we emulate God by resting on the Sabbath day, we can be refreshed also. Physical rest on the Sabbath, what that does is it refreshes our bodies, and we all understand that. But he sanctified, God sanctified it for us to draw close to him. That's where the refreshment comes from. It is by God's very design that all people should rest from their labors for 24 hours a day on the day that he created for them and be spiritually refreshed by building a close relationship with him. That's what he wants. Sabbath observance can spiritually refresh our minds if we allow it to do so. We could just be here. We could just be here just going through the motions or we can allow it to refresh our minds. We can allow it to refresh our bodies and our thoughts. A time to catch our breath, a time to pause from all of our regular routines so that we can focus on what is really important. And so the Sabbath itself is one of those times of refreshment that God gives us every week. Now, of course, that brings us to the third occasion of refreshment here. And this one is very similar to that of restoration in that it looks towards the future, a future that we all have. It looks toward for, forward to a time when Jesus Christ will return. And that truly will be a time of refreshment. A time that's pictured in the plan of God and it's symbolized by the, the, the feast that is coming up very soon, the Feast of Trumpets. Well, we will be observing that. This time of refreshing that comes from the return of Christ. So if you would turn with me back to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Brethren, if we, when we look around ourselves, when we look at this world right now, um, how long do we really believe that this world can continue down this road that it has chosen? Um, the world has gone insane. Everything you read about or, or see or hear about what's going on out there, it's insane. It's upside down. And we knew that this was going to happen. But it, it's hard to take sometimes. The world has gone insane. and um, Man cannot figure out how to do it right. He just cannot. It's not in him. We need the return of Christ. And when Christ does return and the restoration begins, there will be a refreshment for the entire world at that time. Zechariah chapter 14 is a powerful description of the return of Christ. And um, it will be a wonderful and a time full of awe. And what I mean by that is we use the word awesome to mean something that's good today. But in the 16th century, if you'd have said awesome, the word would have meant that is a thing that sends shivers down my spine. So it will be wonderful when he returns back on the Mount of Olives. But at, there will be shaking of boots. People will be hiding. They will be fighting. He will touch down on the Mount of Olives, and it will be a wonderful thing and also an awesome thing. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8. Let's go ahead and read this. And in that day it shall be that the living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea. Refreshing waters of life. Refreshing waters of life. And in both summer and in winter it shall occur. It will never stop. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day it shall be the Lord is one, and his name is one. And then in verses 12 through 15, that's the awesome part. The part where mankind will be shaking in their boots. But let's go ahead and drop down to verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. There is a time in the future when the entire world will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We rehearse this every year at the feast. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, and you don't have to turn there, it says, And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Pointing to the very fact that we should be rejoicing. And in a way, brethren, God commands us to do that to be refreshed with joy in our hearts. Just like we should be refreshed being here today, we have seven days at the Feast of Tabernacles, and then we have the extra, the eighth day also, 
to be refreshed and rejoice before the Lord our God. You know, the Feast of Tabernacles, God's holy days, they're a way that we get a taste of the future kingdom now. And we have this season, we have three seasons a year, and we have these seasons of refreshing every year in this physical life. It's something that we get to experience now. So brethren, in conclusion, God has a plan to quench our spiritual thirst. And we, be, and we can begin to taste that refreshment through baptism, the receiving of his Holy Spirit, and in the keeping of the Sabbath and his holy days. So we have to take that opportunity then to be refreshed, to be a part of his restoration process, developing his character that he can use in the kingdom of God, to be reshaped and rejuvenated by God through his word, his spirit, and through the messages that he gives us. So brethren, take that opportunity to honor him on the Sabbath and his feasts, and take that wonderful drink of refreshment that comes from our great God.